This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Laura Dornan. What Katie Did by Susan Coolidge. Dedication. To five. Six of us once, my darlings, played together beneath green boughs, which faded long ago, made merry in the golden summer weather, pelted each other with new fallen snow. Did the sun always shine? I can't remember a single cloud that dimmed the happy blue, a single lightning bolt or peal of thunder, to daunt our bright unfearing lives. Can you? We quarrelled often, but made peace as quickly, shed many tears, but laughed the while they fell, had our small woes, our childish bumps and bruises, but mother always kissed and made them well. Is it long since? It seems a moment only. Yet here we are in bonnets and tailcoats, grave men of business, members of committees. Our playtime ended, even baby votes. And star-eyed children, in whose innocent faces kindles the gladness which was once our own, cried round our knees with sweet and coaxing voices, asking for stories of that old-time home. Were you once little too? They say, astonished. Did you too play? How funny! Tell us how. Almost we start, forgetful for a moment. Almost we answer, we are little now. Dear friend and lover, whom to-day we christen, forgive such brief bewilderment, thy true and kindly hand we hold, we own thee fairest. But, ah, our yesterday was precious too. So, darlings, take this little childish story, in which such gleams of the old sunshine play, and, as with careless hands you turn the pages, look back and smile, as here I smile to-day. End of Dedication Chapter 1 The Little Cars I was sitting in the meadows one day, not long ago, at a place where there was a small brook. It was a hot day. The sky was very blue, and white clouds, like great swans, went floating over it to and fro. Just opposite me was a clump of green rushes, with dark velvety spikes and among them one single tall red cardinal flower, which was bending over the brook, as if to see its own beautiful face in the water. But the cardinal did not seem to be vain. The picture was so pretty that I sat a long time enjoying it. Suddenly, close to me, two small voices began to talk, or to sing, for I couldn't tell exactly which it was. One voice was shrill, the other, which was a little deeper, sounded very positive and cross. They were evidently disputing about something, for they said the same words over and over again. These were the words. Katie did. Katie didn't. She did. She didn't. She did. She didn't. Did. Didn't. I think they must have repeated them at least a hundred times. I got up from my seat to see if I could find the speakers, and sure enough, there, in one of the cattail bulrushes, I spied two tiny pale green creatures. Their eyes seemed to be weak, for they both wore black goggles. They had six legs apiece, two short ones, two not so short, and two very long. These last legs had joints like the springs of a carriage, and as I watched, they began walking up the rush, and then I saw that they moved exactly like an old-fashioned gig. In fact, if I hadn't been too big, I think I should have heard them creak as they went along. They didn't say anything so long as I was there, but the moment my back was turned they began to quarrel again, and in the same old words. Katie did. Katie didn't. She did. She didn't. As I walked home, I fell to thinking about another Katie, a Katie I once knew, who planned to do a great many wonderful things and in the end did none of them, but something quite different. 
something she didn't like at all at first, but which, on the whole, was a great deal better than any of the doings she had dreamed about. And as I thought, this little story grew in my head, and I resolved to write it down for you. I have done it, and, in the memory of my two little friends on the bulrush, I give it their name. Here it is, the story of what Katie did. Katie's name was Katie Carr. She lived in the town of Burnet, which wasn't a very big town, but was growing fast. The house she lived in stood on the edge of the town. It was a large square house, white, with green blinds, and had a porch in front, over which roses and clematis made a thick bower. Four tall locust trees shaded the gravel path which led to the front gate. On one side of the house was an orchard. On the other side were wood piles and barns, and an ice house. Behind was a kitchen garden sloping to the south, and behind that a pasture with a brook in it, and butternut trees, and four cows. Two red ones, a yellow one with sharp horns tipped with tin, and a dear little white one named Daisy. There were six of the car children, four girls and two boys. Katie, the oldest, was twelve years old. Little Phil, the youngest, was four, and the rest fitted in between. Dr. Carr, their papa, was a dear, kind, busy man, who was away from home all day, and sometimes all night too, taking care of sick people. The children hadn't any mamma. She had died when Phil was a baby, four years before my story began. Katie could remember her pretty well. To the rest, she was but a sad, sweet name, spoken on a Sunday and at prayer times, or when Papa was specially gentle and solemn. In place of this mamma, whom they recollected so dimly, there was Aunt Izzy, Papa's sister, who came to take care of them when Mamma went away on that long journey, from which, for so many months, the little ones kept hoping she might return. Aunt Izzy was a small woman, sharp-faced and thin, rather old-looking and very neat and particular about everything. She meant to be kind to the children, but they puzzled her much, because they were not a bit like herself when she was a child. Aunt Izzy had been a gentle, tidy little thing, who loved to sit as Curly Locks did, sewing long seams in the parlour, and to have her head patted by older people, and be told that she was a good girl. Whereas Katie tore her dress every day, hated sewing, and didn't care a button about being called good, while Clover and Elsie shied off like restless ponies when anyone tried to pat their heads. It was very perplexing to Aunt Izzy, and she found it hard to quite forgive the children for being so strange, and so little like the good boys and girls in Sunday school memoirs, who were the young people she liked best, and understood most about. Then Dr. Carr was another person who worried her. He wished to have the children hardy and bold, and encouraged climbing in rough plays, in spite of the bumps and ragged clothes which resulted. In fact, there was just one half hour of the day when Aunt Izzy was really satisfied about her charges and that was the half-hour before breakfast, which she had made a law that they all had to sit in their little chairs and learn the Bible verse for the day. At this time she looked at them with pleased eyes. They were all so spick and span, with such nicely brushed jackets and such neatly combed hair. But the moment the bell rang, her comfort was over. From that time on, they were what she called not fit to be seen. The neighbours pitied her very much, they used to count the sixty stiff white pantalet legs hung out to dry every Monday morning, and say to each other, What a sight of washing those children made, and what a trouble it must be for poor Miss Carr to keep them so nice. But poor Miss Carr didn't think them at all nice. That was the worst of it. Clover, go upstairs and wash your hands. Dory, pick your hat off the floor and hang it on the nail. Not that nail, the third nail from the corner. These were the kind of things Aunt Izzy was saying all day long. The children minded her pretty well, but they didn't exactly love her, I fear. They called her Aunt Izzy, always. Never, Auntie. Boys and girls will know what that meant. 
I want to show you the little cars, and I don't know that I could ever have a better chance than one day when five out of the six were perched on top of the ice house, like chickens on a roost. This ice house was one of their favourite places. It was only a low roof set over a hole in the ground, and, as it stood in the middle of the side yard, it always seemed to the children that the shortest road to every place was up one of its slopes and down the other. They also liked to mount to its ridge pole, and then, still keeping the sitting position, to let go and scrape slowly down the warm shingles to the ground. It was bad for their shoes and trousers, of course, but what of that? Shoes and trousers, and clothes generally, were Aunt Izzy's affair. Theirs was to slide and enjoy themselves. Clover, next in age to Katie, sat in the middle. She was a fair, sweet dumpling of a girl, with thick pigtails of light brown hair and short-sighted blue eyes, which seemed to hold tears just ready to fall from under the blue. Really, Clover was the jolliest little thing in the world, but these eyes and her soft, cooing voice always made people feel like petting her and taking her part. Once, when she was very small, she ran away with Katie's doll, and when Katie pursued and tried to take it from her, Clover held fast and would not let go. Dr. Carr, who wasn't attending particularly, heard nothing but the pathetic tone of Clover's voice as she said, Me won't! Me want Dolly! And, without stopping to inquire, he called out sharply, For shame, Katie! Give your sister her doll at once! Which Katie, much surprised, did, while Clover purred in triumph like a satisfied kitten. Clover was sunny and sweet-tempered, a little indolent, and very modest about herself, though, in fact, she was particularly clever in all sorts of games, an extremely droll and funny and quiet way. Everybody loved her, and she loved everybody, especially Katie, whom she looked up to as one of the wisest people in the world. Pretty little Phil sat next on the roof to Clover, and she held him tight with her arm. Then came Elsie, a thin, brown child of eight, with beautiful dark eyes and crisp short curls covering the whole of her small head. Poor little Elsie was the odd one among the cars. She didn't seem to belong exactly to either the older or the younger children. The great desire and ambition of her heart was to be allowed to go about with Katie and Clover and Cecy Hall and to know their secrets and be permitted to put notes in the little post offices they were forever establishing in all sorts of hidden places. But they didn't want Elsie, and used to tell her to run away and play with the children, which hurt her feelings very much. When she wouldn't run away, I'm sorry to say they ran away from her, which, as her legs were longest, it was easy to do. Poor Elsie, left behind, would cry bitter tears, and, as she was too proud to play much with Dory and John, her principal comfort was tracking the older ones about and discovering their mysteries, especially the post offices, which were her greatest grievance. Her eyes were bright and quick as a bird's. She would peep and peer and follow and watch, till at last, in some odd, unlikely place, the crotch of a tree, the middle of an asparagus bed, or, perhaps, on the very top step of the scuttle ladder, she spied the little paper box, with its load of notes all ending with, be sure and not let Elsie know. Then she would seize the box, and, marching up to wherever the others were, she would throw it down, saying defiantly, There's your old post office! But feeling all the time just like crying. Poor little Elsie! In almost every big family, there is one of these unmated, left-out children. Katie, who had the finest plans in the world for being heroic, and of use, never saw, as she drifted on her heedless way, that here, in this lonely little sister, was the very chance she wanted for being a comfort to somebody who needed comfort very much. She never saw it, and Elsie's heavy heart went uncheered. Dory and Joanna sat on the two ends of the ridge pole. Dory was six years old, a pale pudgy boy with rather a solemn face and smears of molasses on the sleeve of his jacket. Joanna, whom the children called John and Johnny, 
was a square, splendid child, a year younger than Dorry. She had big, brave eyes and a wide, rosy mouth, which always looked ready to laugh. These two were great friends, though Dorry seemed like a girl who had got into a boy's clothes by mistake, and Johnny like a boy who, in a fit of fun, had borrowed his sister's frock. And now, as they all sat there chattering and giggling, the window above opened, a glad shriek was heard, and Katie's head appeared. In her hand she held a heap of stockings, which she waved triumphantly. "'Hooray!' she cried. "'All done, and Aunt Izzy says we may go.' "'Are you tired out waiting?' "'I couldn't help it. The holes were so big and took so long. "'Hurry up, Clover, and get the things. Cece and I will be down in a minute.' The children jumped up gladly and slid down the roof. Clover fetched a couple of baskets from the woodshed. Elsie ran for her kitten. Dory and John loaded themselves with two great faggots of green boys. Just as they were ready, the side door banged and Katie and Cece Hall came into the yard. I must tell you about Cece. She was a great friend of the children's and lived in a house next door. The yard of the houses were only separated by a green hedge with no git, so that Cece spent two-thirds of her time at Dr. Carr's, and was exactly like one of the family. She was a neat, dapper, pink-and-white girl, modest and prim in manner, with light, shiny hair, which always kept smooth, and slim hands, which never looked dirty. How different from my poor Katie! Katie's hair was forever untidy. Her gowns were always catching on nails and tearing themselves, and— in spite of her age and size, she was as heedless and innocent as a child of six. Katie was the longest girl that ever was seen. What she did to make herself grow so, nobody could tell. But there she was, up above Papa's ear, and half a head taller than poor Aunt Izzy. Whenever she stopped to think about her height, she became very awkward, and felt as if she were all legs and elbows and ankles and joints. Happily, her head was so full of other things, of plans and schemes and fancies of all sorts, that she didn't often take time to remember how tall she was. She was a dear, loving child, for all her careless habits, and made bushels of good resolutions every week of her life. Only unluckily, she never kept any of them. She had fits of responsibility about the other children, and longed to set them a good example. But when the chance came, she generally forgot to do so. Katie's days flew like the wind, for when she wasn't studying lessons or sewing and darning with Aunt Izzy, which she hated extremely, there were always so many delightful schemes riding in her brains that all she wished was for ten pairs of hands to carry them all out. These same active brains got her into perpetual scrapes. She was fond of building castles in the air and dreaming of the time when something she had done would make her famous, so that every one would hear of her and want to know her. I don't think she had made up her mind what this wonderful thing was to be, but while thinking about it she often forgot to learn a lesson or to lace her boots, and then she had a bad mark or a scolding from Aunt Izzy. At such times she consoled herself with planning how, by and by, she would be beautiful and beloved and amiable as an angel. A great deal was to happen to Katie before that time came. Her eyes, which were black, were to turn blue. Her nose was to lengthen and straighten, and her mouth, quite too large at present to suit the part of a heroine, was to be made over into sort of a rosy button. Meanwhile, and until these charming changes should take place, Katie forgot her features as much as she could, though still, I think, the person on earth whom she envied was that lady on the outside of the Trichophorus bottles, with the wonderful hair which sweeps the ground. End of chapter 1